Okay, welcome back again. We are studying verse by verse through the book of Acts, and I am Robert Breaker. And the last time we finished up Acts chapter 1, and I am enjoying this Bible study on the book of Acts. I'm just, wow. And there's so much that we can see in the book of Acts. We just need to remember how important the book of Acts is, and we need to rightly divide it. I've said several times so far already that some denominations hang their necks on the book of Acts. That, that is, they go to the book of Acts and they get messed up because they try to take the book of Acts and apply some things that took part in the early book of Acts to themselves. And they try to say, well, you know, all of the book of Acts applies to us today. No, no, I'm going to have to say it again, <laughs> and you'll probably hear me say it many times. The book of Acts is a transitional book. So let me go ahead and write that up here again. Acts is a transitional book. All right? So when we go to the book of Acts, the book of Acts is starting out, and everything that's taking place in the book of Acts is all to the Jews. Then there's something that takes place. It's actually, several things take place. And there's a transition taking place. So you've got to remember that this is the early book of Acts. We can't take our doctrine for today from the early book of Acts. Because it changes as we go through the book. So this chapter begins with tongues. And here we get into what the Bible calls tongues. Now, there's a big denomination in the world today that calls itself Christian, and it calls itself the Pentecostal Church. And the Pentecostal Church is a church that loves, boy do they love, to talk about tongues. And they believe that this thing that we're going to read about here in Acts chapter 2, they believe that that's still here for today, and that's still something that we can do today. I want you to remember these two passages of scriptures that we'll look at later. 1 Corinthians 1.22 and 1 Corinthians 14.22. And we will look at why I'm writing these up here a little bit later. Because we're actually going to read the entire book of, of the entire chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14. Because that chapter, 1 Corinthians 14, deals with tongues. So we're going to look at tongues in the Bible today. Now remember, we've looked at this last time. There are no women here in this chapter, chapter 2. So there's no women here um, speaking in tongues. That's so important because this church, called themselves the Pentecostal Church or the Charismatic Church, it's, it's made up of women. It even allow women teachers and deacons. And they say that they can speak in tongues. Well, let's look at this. This is the first time that people begin to speak in tongues. Do what they call themselves the Pentecostals do, do they really do it the way the Bible says? Or are they trying to take the Bible and then force it into what they want it to say to allow people to do what they want to do? There's no women here. We looked at that last time in chapter 1. How, yes, there were some women there in verse 14, but then verse 15 was a different time when it was all men and there was 120 men together. Then they all got together at the end of, of Acts chapter 1, and these men voted on who would be the next apostle. Now, chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. So here's a completely different time. And as we're reading through here, it appears that the people that are together here in Acts chapter 2 are only the 12 apostles. No women present. And we saw last time how that they chose another apostle. They chose Matthias. So there are the 12 apostles. So there's 12 of them that are here in chapter 2 of Acts. Now this chapter clearly shows that only these 12 men spoke in tongues. And it even tells us the tongues that they spoke in, or the languages. Tongues are always a written, spoken language in the Bible. Let me make sure I make that clear from the very beginning. I speak in the English tongue and the Spanish tongue. When I went to Bible school, I learned the Hebrew tongue and the Greek tongue. I don't speak them, at least not often. <laughs> I can read them, and, and, I, and I try to stay away from them because even English is, is my first language, so I might as well stick with it. But I learned, so I've learned four different languages or tongues in my life. And I speak in tongues. I do. I speak in English, and I speak in Spanish, and that's it. 
Those are the main languages that I speak. So in the Bible, tongues are always a written, spoken language. Now I say this because the Pentecostals, or the Charismatics, claim, they say, that they speak in tongues. And when you go to a Pentecostal church, they say they speak in tongues. And you say, oh, well, which tongue do you speak in? Which language? They say, oh, we speak in an unknown tongue. Oh, well, that's convenient, isn't it? So you can't tell me what language you're speaking? Oh, they say, well, it's a heavenly language. Okay. But the Bible talks about an unknown tongue. And it's always in italics, the, the word unknown. Because it's a tongue that's unknown to the church not unknown to the people that are speaking it. And we're going to see that clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. But we're going to start out here in Acts chapter 2. Now I need to say this because the Pentecostals or the charismatic doctrine is that they claim to have the gift, okay? There are people in this denomination that call themselves Pentecostals, all right? Pentecost was the feast, nothing else. Pentecost is a feast of the Jews, it's 50 days after Passover. There is no denomination called Pentecost in the Bible. What these people have done that call themselves Pentecostals, they've taken a Jewish feast and they've tried to say what happened on that Jewish feast is what we do every Sunday. So they want to have a Jewish feast every week. They call themselves charismatic. Now, charis, char, charisma comes from the Greek word and it means gifted or a gift. And so what the Pentecostals want to do, they call themselves charismatics. They say, we're gifted. We have the gift of speaking in tongues. And when you look at the Bible and you actually look at the doctrine that they teach, you go, bah, 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 bah. Uh, no, no you don't. Because you're not, you're not speaking in a written, spoken language. You're saying gibberish in the air. What the Pentecostals and Pentecostals teach, what the Charismatic Doctrine teaches, is that they claim to have the gift of speaking in an unknown tongue. And they claim that they can speak by the Holy Spirit in a language that nobody understands but God. Okay? If that's even true, what good is it? You know, the Bible says preach the word. What good is it to go around and go, blah, 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 and people don't understand it? How is that when in souls? How's that telling people about Jesus? How's that getting saved when you're blabbering in the air and no one understands what you're saying? That It doesn't even make sense. Because in Acts chapter 2 that we're about to start looking at, they understood what was being said when someone spoke in tongues. So the Pentecostals, they claim that what happened here in Acts chapter 2 that we're about to read is the same thing that happens to them. They say that to speak in tongues, they have the Holy Spirit speak through them, and they claim that they speak to God and not unto men. If you are a Pentecostal or you know someone who's a Pentecostal, and you've looked at the Pentecostal doctrine, that's what they teach. They teach that they speak to God, not to men. All right? Well, you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and in 1 Corinthians 14, the very second verse, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh, not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. This is the key verse that the Pentecostals use. And the Pentecostals say, see, when we speak in tongues, we're speaking to God, not unto men. Well, Paul says, yeah, but you're speaking mysteries in the Spirit. Paul is saying, nobody knows what you're saying. God hears you, but he doesn't know what you're saying. And, and they continue by saying that this verse proves that when they get the Holy Spirit and they say, Lord of our they speak in tongues, they say, we're not speaking unto man, we're speaking unto God. Now you ask a Pentecostal, so what is it that your doctrine is? What do you believe? They say that the Holy Spirit in them is speaking to God and that the Spirit is speaking to God in mysteries. All right, let's go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 26 because this verse completely totally undoes their argument. If that's what the Pentecostals believe, and I told you I was four years in the Pentecostal church, I read their books, I followed their doctrine, I listened to their preaching, and they told me that I could only get the Holy Spirit like they get it in Acts 2. And they told me that I had to get the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, and that proved that I had it, and that when I spoke in tongues, it was the Holy Spirit speaking to God through me. Alright? What does the Bible say? about that. I'll never forget 
when I left the Pentecostal church and I got saved and my dad led me to the Lord. I remember several months later going back to Oklahoma to that same church and I told everybody in that church, I'm saved now. I was not saved when I was in your religion. And I want to give you all the gospel and hope that you all get saved too. And they all looked at me and said, oh, you crazy Baptist. I said, no, it's not that I'm a Baptist. It's that I'm saved. Yes, my dad goes to a Baptist church. Yes, I began going to a Baptist church. But I'm not Baptist. I'm born again. And you guys had a false gospel. And I wanted to share that. And they didn't want that. They didn't want to hear what I had to tell them. And I remember there was one guy, the weirdest guy. And he had, he had one eye looking that way and one eye looking that way. So I won't call him cross-eyed, but he had a weird eye. And he says, well, you're wrong, Mr. Breaker. He said, I'm going to take you out, and I'm going to take you to pizza place. Now, in Oklahoma, they have Mazio's Pizza. Mazio's. And so he took me out to Mazio's Pizza, and he took his Bible in, and he says, I'm going to make you a Pentecostal again. I'm going to get you back into our fold because you're wrong. And he took me to Acts chapter 2. He took me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He tried to convert me back to the Pentecostal movement that I had just left. And I shut him down with this one verse. And it was just like, bah, 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 like a computer frying and, and crashing. He was like, I don't know what else to say. He told me, that you get the Holy Spirit by speaking in tongues, and that speaking in tongues is not speaking unto men, it's speaking unto God, and it's the Holy Spirit cries out to God and speaks to God. And I said, okay, come with me to Romans chapter 8, and look at Romans 8, 26. Romans 8, 26. Likewise the Spirit, capital S, that's the Holy Spirit. Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not, we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit, capital S, that's the Holy Spirit, itself maketh intercession for us with groanings, now watch this, which cannot be uttered. And I looked that man in the face, and I didn't know which way he was looking, because one eye was that way, one eye was this way, and I said, you want to tell me that your religion says that you're speaking to God in the Spirit in tongues? And I said, what are you doing uttering things that the Bible says can't be uttered? I said, that's a problem, and that's anti-scriptural, and that's against the Word of God because you can't utter things that can't be uttered. And he said, oh, oh, oh just eat your pizza, and he wouldn't talk to me anymore. <laughs> it's because I knew my Bible, and I couldn't get sucked into that false religion anymore because they were trying to tell me that tongues were for us today and that they were saying nothing and that the Spirit of God was speaking through us and saying things that we didn't know what we're saying. And the Bible says that can't happen. The Holy Spirit makes intercessions to, to God in groanings that cannot be uttered, cannot be spoken. So I've always looked at that church as they were deceiving. They deceived me. Because they twisted the word tongue and made me think it was saying something that you don't know what you're saying. But I'm going to prove to you today what tongues are in the Bible. And they were always in the Scripture something that another person can understand because tongues are for men. Tongues are so that men might hear preaching as we see in Acts chapter 2. So back to Acts chapter 2. Alright, Acts chapter 2. So my question is what are Pentecostals or Charismatics doing claiming to be uttering things that the Bible says cannot be uttered? When you look at the scriptures and you look at Pentecostal doctrine you find that the whole Pentecostal Charismatic movement is based upon a lie and upon not rightly dividing the book of truth. Not rightly the book, dividing the book of Acts. What takes place in Acts chapter 2 is to Jews only. It's nothing that is for us Gentiles. This speaking in tongues is indeed a miracle. It's a sign. It was a gift of God to the apostles. But I want you to see what the Bible says, how it was done. And you compare that to the modern Pentecostal church, and they don't do it the same way as the apostles did proving that it's not what God said. It's their own interpretation of what they believe that tongues are. So without further ado, let's go down there to Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. And when the day of full Pentecost was fully come, again, Pentecost is a Jewish feast. It's the Feast of Harvest. It's 50 days after Passover. So Pentecost is a feast. It's not a denomination. But yet this denomination, this Christian denomination, wants to take a Jewish feast and name themselves 
after that Jewish feast. They call themselves Pentecostals because they claim that what we do is what they did on Pentecost. Okay, let's see if that's even possible. And let's look at the scriptures and see if you really do do what they say you do. All right, so when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. Now, who is the all? The context clearly tells us who the all were, the twelve apostles. Remember, Matthias had been chosen, so he was one of them at that time. There were twelve. Judas had fallen. And verse 14 clearly tells us, but Peter standing up with the eleven. All right, so in this book of Acts, chapter 2, there are twelve apostles here. And it says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. All right, so they must have had a Honda Accord. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's an old joke. Oh, that's an old joke. We used to joke about that and say the apostles drove a Honda Accord because they were all in one accord. <laughs> okay, yeah, I know, I know, bad joke, bad joke. But anyway, it says here, and they were all in with one accord in one place. Now, verse 2, suddenly, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. Okay, so here we are in Acts chapter 2. It's the day of Pentecost. Only present are the twelve apostles. And there's this sound as of a mighty rushing wind. It's the sound of, of a lot of wind. And this is taking place. Now, notice, remember, there's no women here. And we continue reading verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Okay, so it took place in a house. Not in a church. Uh, a lot of your Pentecostal churches, they say, well, you can't, you can't speak in tongues in your own home. You can only do it here with us, so that's why you have to come to our church. <laughs> and yet the Bible says, no, they, they weren't in a church. They were in a house. And it says here, And there appeared of them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. So there were, there were these tongues like as fire. Now notice that it says like like fire. It doesn't say that fire fell on them. It said that there were these tongues, cloven tongues that, that came on them like fire. But it doesn't say there's fire. That's another thing that the Pentecostals do. They want to say that this was the baptism of fire. And they say that you need to get the baptism of fire of the Holy Ghost. And you need to speak in tongues, they say. And they tell you that, that you need this fire. Okay, well, hold on a second. Let's go to Matthew chapter 3. Remember, as we started the book of Acts, Jesus said, um, John indeed baptized you with, with, um, with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days thence. And what they'll do is they'll go, these Pentecostals, to Matthew, and they'll go to the book of Matthew, I want to say chapter 3, yeah, verses 11 and 12. And they say that, that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is also the baptism of fire. And so in your Pentecostal church, they say, we want the baptism of fire. Uh, no, you don't. No, you want the Holy Ghost. You don't want the fire. Because if you would actually read the text, which many Pentecostals don't, I hate to say it, but I've been to many Pentecostal churches in my life, and they don't preach sermons, they preach sermonettes. They get there, they sing for a long time, they do the lullaby, shalabala, and they all fall down on the altars and everything. And you, usually if they do preach a message, it's like 20 minutes, 30 minutes at the most. The rest of them is them with their hands in the air. Lobber, lobber, dobber, dobber. It's like, why isn't the emphasis on the Word? I would much rather have an hour, if I'm going to be at that church, most of those churches, you stay there for two hours, I'd rather a guy preach for two hours than have people you know, doing all this other stuff. To me, the emphasis is on the Word. Notice what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, comma, and with fire. Now, many of your Pentecostals will take the comma out, and they'll take the semicolon off the end of that verse. And they say, so the Holy Ghost baptism is fire baptism, so you've got to be baptized in fire to speak in tongues. You just, you, you have not rightly divided the word of truth. You have not even read the very next verse. When a verse ends with a colon, like this verse does, it's an explanation. You know what a colon is? A colon means what's following is explained by what's mentioned. So when it says you'll be baptized with the Holy Ghost, comma, and with fire, it explains there's two baptisms here. 
There's the true baptism, the Holy Ghost baptism, but there's another baptism, and that's the baptism of fire. Are they the same? Not on your life, because look at the next verse. It's talking about the fire, verse 12, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his weed unto the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. What is this unquenchable fire that burns something up? It's hell! So John the Baptist is preaching, and he's preaching repentance, verse 8. And he's saying, hey Israel, repent and get right with God. There's two baptisms coming. One is the right when you baptize with the Holy Ghost, or else you're going to get fire. You're going to burn in hell in the unquenchable fire that burns for all eternity. So you better be careful when, when you pray for the baptism of fire. You're literally praying, God, give me hell. <laughs> and Pentecostals, they don't read their Bibles. There's two different distinct baptisms there. So I, I never saw such a mess as I saw when I was in the Pentecostal movement. And, and after I got saved and got out, I just see how they just twist the Scripture so much in that religion. And we'll see that today as we look at Acts chapter 2. So it says here, verse 3, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, the twelve apostles. Four, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay? Now, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Alright? Your Pentecostals tell you, now see, you've got to speak in tongues to get the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but it says they were filled here, but you know what? They don't ever read John chapter 20. John chapter 20, Jesus already gave them the Holy Spirit in John chapter 20. Go to John chapter 20, verse 22 and 23. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And then 23 says, Whosoever sins ye remit, they remit unto them, whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. This is in John before Jesus rose up again. Remember we looked at last time how at the 50th days, after 50 days, Jesus rose up, and those two angels came and said, Men and brethren, why are you looking up here? So sometime before Jesus rose again, these twelve, or actually there were eleven at the time, received the Holy Spirit. So they literally got the Holy Spirit already. At Pentecost, they were only filled. You know what it means to be filled? Well, they already had it, so God filled them up a little bit more. It's like filling up your gas tank. You wouldn't have made it to the gas station if it was empty. You already had some in it. You're just filling in more. So what happens is, the Holy Spirit was already given to the disciples. Then at Pentecost, they were filled. They got more. Paul tells us in his writings, Be ye filled with the Spirit. But then he tells us in Ephesians 1.13, We already got the Holy Spirit when we got saved. And we're sealed with it. It can't leave. But you can be filled with it. That means you can have, I guess, more of the Spirit in the sense that the, the closer you get to God, the more you'll be filled with what you already have. So, it's not saying in Acts chapter 2 that the only way to get the Holy Spirit is speak in tongues. No, Ephesians 1.13 has already told us that we get the Holy Spirit and we're sealed with it when we believe the Gospel. So you've got to watch out. These Pentecostals, man, they're just something else. And it says here, verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So who was this? These are the disciples. Now, verse 5, And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews. Notice, not a Gentile in sight. It was all Jews going to Jews, preaching something to Jews. And it says here, There were Jews in Jerusalem. Dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now, they were Jews. Now, if you remember Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry, what he said. Let's write it up here so we don't forget it. Matthew chapter 15. Look at what Jesus Christ said in his earthly ministry. Matthew 20, 15, 24, I think it is. Let me look it up, make sure it looks like 26. Matthew, uh, my notes, sometimes I don't write well. But now, Matthew chapter 15, Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry, notice what he says. Matthew 15, 24, that's correct, Matthew 15, 24. Jesus says, but he answered and said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So in his ministry, Jesus says, I only came to Jews. 
Now, go to Matthew chapter 10. And we're going to read Matthew 10, verses 5 through 8. Here's Jesus talking to his disciples, who were his disciples. Later, they're called the apostles. They were the 11 or the 12. And notice what it says in Matthew chapter 10. This is so important that we rightly divide the word of truth because Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, not for Gentiles, only Jews. Everything that's happening there is only for Jews. You've got to get that because the Pentecostal church, it's all Gentiles saying, oh, we want this for us. No, it was something that was only for Jews, not for Gentiles. Otherwise, Paul shouldn't be in the Bible because Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles. He's taken that message to the Gentiles, the different message than this. Uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, Then Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not in the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but rather, go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus tells his disciples in their ministry, Hey guys, only Jews. Never ever to the Gentiles yet. Only to Jews. And what did God say to them? Well, he says, verse 7, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you have received, freely give. So they've got these signs with them, what we call the signs of the apostles. So they're supposed to do these signs. Now, 1 Corinthians 1.22 says signs are for the Jews. So as we're reading through the early book of Acts, we find out it's only for Jews. It's not for Gentiles. Paul tells us when he starts to go to Gentiles that he said the signs shall cease. And uh, he was a, an apostle and he had these signs. And as he gets older in his ministry, the signs begin to cease and he begins to lose this ability, this power to heal. So these signs, these wonders that these apostles are doing, they were so that Jews would believe because Jews don't believe without a sign. But the Greeks, they seek after wisdom. Paul says we live by faith, not by sight. But in order for the church to start, and it was only with Jews, they wouldn't believe unless they saw a sign. So God said, okay, I'm going to give them a bunch of signs. And here's one of the signs, the sign of tongues. All right, what was this sign of tongues, and how did it work, and what happened? All right, verse 5 again, And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Well, let me stop right there. Every nation. Go to Matthew chapter 28. Jesus told his disciples to go forth into all nations. Well, they didn't have to go very far because all these nations came to Jerusalem. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you all the way even to the end of the world. So Jesus is telling his disciples before he goes up to heaven, now you're going to go to all nations of the earth and teach them to follow me, Jesus and tell them what I tell you. Well, in Acts chapter 2, all the nations have come. So that's amazing. There's all the nations under heaven. It says in verse 5, out of every nation under heaven. Now, verse 6. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. What does confounded mean? Confused. Why were they confounded? What was so confusing? What were people going, what's going on? What was the miracle in Acts chapter 2? Because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Tongues. What does that mean? They heard them speak in their own language. This was the gift of tongues. This is the apostle's sign. This is what true tongues are in the Bible. This was the gift. This was the apostles speaking in tongues. Do the modern Pentecostals do that when they claim to speak in tongues? Not on your life. When a person today who claims to be a Pentecostal says, and I speak in tongues, and you watch them speak in tongues, this is what they do. And you look at that and you go, uh, I didn't understand uh, one word of that. <laughs> what did you say? And you ask them what they say. They say, well, I don't know, but God knows. <laughs> what good is that if you don't know what you said? And I don't know what you said. How do you know you didn't curse God in Swahili? How do you know? I've told you this before. When I was in Honduras, there was a 
Pentecostal church up the road. Actually, they were holding this church, but they had some Pentecostal preacher, missionary woman from America come uh, to their group. And they had some of the people in the neighborhood over there, and they had their Pentecostal movement um, message thing. And this woman was trying to teach these young people how to speak in tongues. Guess what happened? This young man in that church was from Honduras and only spoke Spanish. He didn't know one word of English. But he put his hands in the air and he began to curse God in fluent English and scream against God and call God every name in the book in perfect English, better than a sailor could do. And they got scared because that missionary spoke English and she said, why is this guy cursing God? And guess who those people went and asked to come help? They came over to us, Baptists, and they said, we've got a problem. We're having a tongues meeting, and this guy's speaking in perfect English, and he doesn't know English, and he's cursing God. And immediately it was like, well, he's got a demon. So maybe you should rethink what you're doing because you're not giving people the Holy Spirit. You're giving them demons. You better rethink what you do and see if it lines up with the Bible. So here's what happened. Acts chapter 2. The multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. So true tongues in the time of the apostles, the gift was these 11 or these 12. They did not know these 12 apostles. They didn't know different languages. But God gave them this gift that when they opened their mouth, they started speaking in another language. And people that spoke that language were like, wow, I understand every word he's saying. It would be like me all of a sudden preaching in perfect German, and I don't even know German. <laughs> I wish I could do that. I, I want to learn German really bad, but I just don't have the time. That would be the equivalent of what tongues are in Acts chapter 2. Or let's say I, I just started, Ni hao chi tao pi dao, I just started preaching in fluent Chinese. I don't speak Chinese. But the Holy Spirit opens my mouth and makes me speak Chinese for somebody or Japanese or something. That would be the equivalent of Acts chapter 2, of the true gift of tongues. Your Pentecostal movement today does not, they do not do that. They are not speaking in another language. They are blabbering in the air, and they are in disobedience to God in the Bible because they claim the Holy Spirit of God is speaking that through them, and the Bible says the Holy Spirit make intercession with groanings that cannot be uttered. Why are they uttering things that can't be uttered? Because they're Bible ignoramus. Because they're not rightly dividing the word of truth. Because they're taking something that happened for Jews only and trying to push it over here to the Gentiles. Because they don't rightly divide. Now, I've told you, I don't hate Pentecostals. But I'm very saddened by them and their doctrines. And they're not following the scriptures as they are written. So again, it says there in verse 6, The multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. So every one of the twelve apostles was speaking in a different language, a language that he ever, never even learned. And that was truly the Holy Spirit speaking through him in another language as a sign so that the Jews would believe. Now verse 7, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Right? So... Aren't these all Jewish people from Galilee? What's going on? How come every one of them speak in a different language? Verse 8, And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Now, verse 9 to verse 11, he mentions where they came from. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Libya or in Egypt and the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Ara Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So they heard spoken in their own language. And these 12 apostles just started speaking, and it says that there were people from all nations there at that time. And it says, and it gives you how many there are. It says there are Parthians. Now, I don't know what language the Parthians speak. Whatever it is, one of the apostles spoke the Parthians language. It says the Medes. Now, the Medes were Medes and Persians. So maybe one of them began to speak in Persian. It says the Elamites. Look at that, the Elamites. Then it says those from Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. 
I don't know what they speak in Mesopotamia, but whatever it is, one of the apostles was speaking it. Then it says Judea, but we know Judea is Hebrew, so I'm going to skip that one. Then it says Cappadocia. Cappadocia. Whatever they speak in Cappadocia, I guess Cappadocian, one of the apostles was preaching in Cappadocian. Never learned that language before a day in his life. But the Holy Spirit of God took control of his tongue and made him speak in another language. It says Asia is another one. Then it says Phrygia. Now, I don't know what they speak in Phrygia, but whatever it is, one of them was preaching in that language. Then it says Pamphylia. Pamphylia. Then it says Egypt, and then it doesn't... It, it kind of includes with Egypt those around Libya, as though those in Libya and Cyrene, they spoke the same language. Some sort of Egyptian. And then verse 11, it talks about Rome. What would they have spoken in Rome? Why, Latin. And then it says, Cretes and Arabs. Cretes and Arabians. Well, Arabians, what would they have spoken? I guess Arabic. So do you see what the Bible says is the true gift of tongues? Do you see it? How dare anybody say that they speak in tongues? And then when they open their mouth and claim to speak in tongues, they're not saying anything that anyone understands. How dare they? Because in the Bible, true tongues are always a written, spoken language. And when these apostles had this gift from God and they spoke in that language, it was a language from all the different nations of the earth that those people from that area heard and understood. That's not my opinion. That's not my denominational teaching. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. Now, <clears throat> there are some people that say the miracle was the apostles speaking, but and then it says, and they heard them speak in their own language. And they say the miracle was just that the people's ears were opened and heard it in their language. But I don't think so. I think the miracle was that they were literally speaking in that language. But either way, it's a miracle. And either way, the hearer was understanding something in their own language and getting something out of it. They were getting edified. They were getting preached to. What the Pentecostals do today edifies no one. They don't preach. They just blabber. No. What did I just say? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. So you got to be careful. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of neat YouTube videos that when you, when you go to YouTube videos and you look up these big name Pentecostals and you see them in their little church, uh, uh, churches and they're supposedly speaking in tongues, there's a lot of videos where people have slowed it down or they've played it backwards, or they've, they've broken it up to syllables, and oftentimes it's cursing God. Oftentimes it's saying something that's not godly. It's, it's saying, mark of the beast, take the mark of the beast. It sounds like demons are inside those people speaking through them, and that it's not God. So I would be scared to death to join the Pentecostal movement. I'm so glad that I got the gospel and got saved and got out of there. I told you, when I was in that movement, they never told me the gospel. They never told me about Paul. They never told me how to get saved. They were trying to get me to do something that the apostles did, and I'm not an apostle. And they're trying to deceive me into thinking that I was doing good when the Bible itself tells me that I can't even utter what I'm supposed to be uttering because the Holy Spirit makes groanings that cannot be uttered. So it was me that was saying, It wasn't the Spirit of God. I didn't even have the Holy Spirit because I wasn't even saved yet. I got the Holy Spirit when I believed the Gospel. And now I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I wish this gift of speaking in tongues was around today. Because what a blessing it would have been when I went to Honduras to automatically know perfect Spanish and be preaching and teaching in Spanish. Sadly, I had to go to school. I had to take three days a week, eight hours a day, Spanish lessons for the first year or so. Or actually, the first six months I was in Honduras. I had four years in high school of Spanish, and I'm, I'm still learning. I think I'm on a, like a 10th or 11th grade uh, reading level in Spanish. I mean, I wish I could say I was a college graduate level in Spanish. I mean, I speak Spanish, uh, but there's I try to stay away from the big words. <laughs> I speak well enough to be able to preach, but I don't need to know the big, huge words that you go to college for. But I do speak and preach in Spanish. Every week I put a new sermon in English and Spanish. But this is what true tongues are in the Bible. This is what the gift of the apostles was, is that God laid upon each one of these apostles a different language 
and they spoke and preached in that language, and people from around the world, all these different nations, heard that language spoken in their own tongue. And it's amazing. It's amazing that that took place. Now, let's continue reading there, because I want to go over to... Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, because people say, well, is tongues gone? Well, the Bible says tongues shall cease, but is the gift of tongues gone? Is there a gift of tongues today? I don't think so. I don't see it, at least not like the apostles got it. But yes, there are tongues today. As long as people are reading and writing and speaking a literal written spoken language, then yes, there are tongues. And in, Acts, uh, and in 1 Corinthians 14, it talks about the rules for how to speak in tongues in a church. And I want to go there and show you what that is. But let me go ahead and read down here verse, all the way down to verse 15. Okay, so back to verse 6. The multitudes came together and were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. Verse 7. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Eight, and how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Verse 9, 10, and 11, all these different places where men were from, and they all heard in their own language. So 12 different languages at least. And, and from what I've gone through and looked at, I, I found what oh, looks like 12 different zones, so 12 different languages. Now it talks about Judea. I left Judea out because they were in Judea already. Okay? But it says here, Parthians, verse 9, and Medes, and Elamites, and the dwellers in Mesopotamia, and in Judah, and Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, and Egypt, and in the parts of Libya around Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes, Cretes, and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So when they spoke in these tongues, whatever they were saying, it was the Holy Spirit of God speaking in the language that someone understood about the works of God. They were probably saying, Listen here, the Messiah of Israel has come. God manifest in the flesh has come. He's done many wonderful works in the world. You must believe in Him. He is God, the, the Creator in the flesh, come for you. And, and, and they heard these things in their language. Now, what happened? Verse 12, and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? <laughs> Do you think so? I mean, yeah. They're like, what's going on? These, these, why would they say that? What does this mean? They couldn't figure this out because the twelve apostles were pretty much unlearned men. Um, Peter was the head of the twelve apostles. He was a fisherman. He didn't have much schooling. Probably didn't speak correctly. Probably had you know a little accent. Probably like a backwood Hicks person would today. And they probably look at that going, well, when did he learn to speak Cappadocian? <laughs> and then look over there at Andrew and a fisherman. Who taught him how to speak Arabic or, or Arabic? And they probably looked over at you know one of the others and like, how'd he learn to speak Persian? You know, and they're just they're scratching their head going, What is this? Well, you know what it was? God. God speaking through them so that those people in those languages would hear the wonderful works of God. So they said, What meaneth this? Now verse 13, others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. <laughs> That's a joke. You can't be full of new wine and be drunk. What is new wine? Grape juice. So it's like they're making a joke. Well, they're drunk. Yeah, yeah, they're drunk on grape juice. Because if they were drunk, you slur your words. You see, if I was drunk, I'd be up here going, And, uh, you know what else is says in the Bible? You know, you would say, man, you look drunk because you're not pronounced. No, they pronounce perfectly, fluently in those languages. So when somebody said, man, those guys are drunk, the guy goes, no, I hear every word clearly. That guy's not drunk. So like, well, maybe he's drunk on, on grape juice then. <laughs> this is kind of a joke, a tongue-in-cheek type of thing there. It can't be denied what was taking place was a miracle of God. Men who didn't know these languages before are now perfectly, fluently speaking in these languages the works of God, the wonderful works of God. Verse 11. Now, verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Now, he's probably speaking in Hebrew now, because he's speaking to the Jews. He says, verse 5, But these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. Third hour of the day in Jewish time would be nine in the morning. So he says, listen to me, we're not drunk. If we're drunk, we're drunk on the Spirit of God. <laughs> the Holy Spirit of God is inside of us, and He's speaking through us, and we're saying things, and 
we're just like, man, these guys over here from those countries are, are running to us and listening and going, how'd you know my language? What are you telling me? What is this all about? And they preached unto them what? Jesus Christ, the Messiah of Israel. So that's true tongues, all right? Is that what the Pentecostal church does? When's the last time you ever heard of a Pentecostal church? And the people in the church that started speaking, they started speaking in Persian or in Cappadocian or, or in, in Latin or in perfect another language and someone that spoke that language understood it. You don't. Your typical modern Assembly of God, Pentecostal, charismatic church today, when they claim to speak in tongues, no one knows what they're saying because they're blabbering. They're not speaking a written spoken language. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I want to read this chapter as quickly as possible in context because part of the confusion here is the word unknown. Now the King James Bible puts the word unknown tongue and it puts the word unknown in italics. So when we read 1 Corinthians 14 we find the word unknown in italics. There's a reason for that. Paul is speaking about tongues in the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. What he's talking about is when someone comes to a church and they're speaking in another language he gives the rules of what you're to do in that church. He's not talking about when you come and speak in an unknown tongue and say, Oh, No. It's always a written spoken language. Tongues are always a written spoken language. I want you to understand that. Tongues is never blabbering and you don't know what you're saying. Tongues are for edifying. So let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and see how it's written according to Paul and what it's about. Because it's not the way the Pentecostals try to tell you. Pentecostals say, when I speak in tongues, I have no idea what I'm saying. Then you're not speaking in tongues. Because when they spoke in tongues in Acts chapter 2, someone else understood perfectly because tongues are a written spoken language. It's not just blabbering in the air. So when the Bible talks about an unknown tongue in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it's talking about a tongue that is unknown to the church. That is, for example, let's say the entire church speaks Greek. Somebody comes into the church and they speak Latin. Nobody in the church speaks Latin. They say, well, that's an unknown tongue to us. We don't know what he's saying. Now, there's rules there. Now, if someone comes in and he says, well, I speak Greek and Latin, then what's he supposed to do? He's supposed to interpret. So, hey, this guy just said such and such in Latin. And here, let me explain that to you in Greek. And then it says two or by three. So let's say a guy speaks Latin and he comes to a Greek church, but nobody speaks uh, a Latin. But a guy says, um, you know, I speak Latin and French. And the guy goes up, well, I speak French and Greek. Okay, well, then you got two interpreters, and the guy's talking in Latin, and it's translated to French, from French to Greek, and, and French to, to, to another language. And, it, and so you got, so anyway, this, this is what it's talking about. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. What is prophesy? Prophesy is preaching. Teaching what the Bible says. The Bible is a book of prophecy, so teaching the Word of God. Verse 2, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. Alright, do you get that? If a guy comes to a church and he speaks in a language that no one knows, he's not doing anything as the early apostles did. He's not edifying anybody. He speaketh not to men because men don't understand what he's saying. Only God knows what he's saying, because he comes in there, he, he, he has his own language that he's used to speaking. And in the Spirit, he speaketh mysteries, because it's not a spiritual gift to speak in a language that nobody understands. Do you get that? Verse 3, But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. What do you go to church for? to hear preaching of the Word of God so that you might be edified, exhorted, and comforted. You don't go to church like the Pentecostals do to sit around and listen to people go blah, 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 and nobody knows what's being said. That's not what church is for. That edifies no one. That is not real tongues. What are you doing trying to um, utter things that the Bible says cannot be uttered? Now verse 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Okay, so someone comes in the church, speaks a different language, he only edifies himself, because he himself knows what he's saying, but nobody else understands. 
So make sure you seek to prophesy and edify the church. Make sure that you preach in the language that the church understands so we can all learn something. That's what church is supposed to be about. Verse 5, I would that you all spake with tongues. What is Paul saying? He's saying, I wish you all knew different languages. I wish everybody in the church could speak ten different languages. Then nobody would ever be confused. We'd all understand each other. That's what he's saying here. I would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that you prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. See, it's all about the church being edified by what's said. It's not about going to church and claiming to speak in tongues in a, in a language that nobody understands. That's, that's ludicrous. Why don't you just stay home and do that? Why are you even going? It's, it's ridiculous. It's about edifying. It's about knowing what's being said. Because, like I said, how do you know you're not cursing God? You don't. Matter of fact, the Bible gives us many warnings about doing what the heathen do. And by their much speaking, they think they'll be heard of God. Many warnings against saying things with your mouth. Vain repetitions and words that you don't know what you're saying. Now, verse 6. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues... What shall it profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation, or by knowledge, or by prophesying, or by doctrine? What if I come to you saying something in a different language? You don't get edified. Unless I come speaking in your language, and I give you doctrine, and I give you these things. Verse 7, And even things without life-giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give it extinction in the sounds, how shall be known what is piped or harp? How do you know? Okay, There's, There were different signals. I mean, if you're in the military, they have horns. You know that I don't know what that means. Does that mean attack or retreat or something? That they used to have different sounds that they'd make, and those sounds meant something, and you knew what that sound meant, and you could act upon it. Well, that's what sound is for. God gives us a voice so we can tell people things, so that they'll know things. And He talks about verse eight, a trumpet. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for the battle? You know. Um, verse 9, So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken, for she shall speak in the air. I love that. If all you're doing is saying, and you're not speaking in any tongue known to man on the face of the earth, you're just speaking in the air. And what good is that? You're a Pentecostal. You say, well, I'm speaking to God. The Holy Spirit in me is making intercession to God. Yeah, but the Bible says with groanings that can't be uttered. So what are you doing uttering something that the Bible says that can't? You're wrong. You have a false denomination and a false teaching. Your tongues are not the same as the tongues of the early apostles. Tongues are a written, spoken language that someone else can understand. You've got a problem. You've got a false denomination. You need to get out because you might be getting a demon. You ever heard of the Kundalini movement? The Kundalini, Kundalini movement over in India is this movement where you put your hands in the air and you say a mantra. You say the same thing over. And by repeating the same thing, eventually you allow a demon to come inside of you. You know what happens when a person gets a demon? They start to shake in convulsions like this. You look at many Pentecostal churches, you know what you see? And I look at that and I go, well, I don't understand what they're saying. Nobody else can understand it. I guess it must be a demon because it sure ain't of God. Because God says they're trying to utter things that the Bible says cannot be uttered. Woo, I know I'm making you mad. And that's fine if you're a Pentecostal. I love you. That's why I tell you the truth. I want you to get out of that. I want you to get saved and get the Holy Spirit for real. Not a false spirit. Well, continue on here. Look at what he says here in verse uh, 10. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if uh, I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto them that speak a barbarian, uh, speaketh a barbarian, he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. If I don't know what you're saying, and you don't know what I'm saying, we look at each other and we go, you must be nuts, because you're just blah, 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 blah. And that's what many Pentecostal churches to do. They're blah, 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 blab, blabbering is the term. 13. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown, unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. What does it mean to interpret? If I began to speak in Spanish, and you speak only English, I need an interpreter here that will translate what I say in Spanish into English so that you can understand it. So I need to pray that somebody who speaks my language can interpret that to someone else. That's what he's saying. Verse 4, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is fruitful. If I pray in a tongue that the church doesn't understand, I understand it. 
And in my spirit, I know what I'm saying to God, but they don't. It's unfruitful for them to hear my prayer if it's in another language. Verse 15, what is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say, Amen, at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? <laughs> Let's say I start praying in Spanish, and then I get done. How do you know if you can say Amen or not to what I just prayed? I might have just prayed, God, kill this person. And you go, well, amen. No, you don't want to say amen. Amen means I agree. How can you agree with something that you don't even know what has been said? Do you understand? So it's all about understanding that language that it might edify the hearer. Verse, uh, oh, here, verse uh, 17. For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. 18, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Okay, You look at the life of Paul. Paul spoke, and we know Paul spoke Hebrew. We know he spoke Greek, and we know he spoke Latin. And most likely he probably spoke Aramaic. So at least three we know for sure, maybe four languages, Paul spoke. So Paul says, I thank God I speak with tongues more than you all. Paul says, I I'm glad that I can speak three or four different languages. I thank God for that 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 I that I have learned those languages and that I can and talk in those languages. Now look at verse 19. Yet in the church I had rather, rather speak five words with my understanding than by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. The Apostle Paul says, I'd rather speak five words so that you can be edified and understand what I'm saying then say, 10,000 different words that are meaningless that no one knows what I'm saying. Do you, do you see how what Paul is saying in this chapter is not what Pentecostals do? Pentecostals are not following the Bible when they have their meetings and they speak in the, into the air and they're not saying anything. It's not the Spirit of God making them utter things which the Bible says that cannot be uttered. It's another spirit or it's the flesh. Look what he says here. That by my voice I may teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Verse 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. Grow up. Learn. He says, verse 21. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and with other lips will I speak unto his people, and yet for all that will they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Now, verse 22. Wherefore tongues are for a sign. Okay? 1 Corinthians 1.22 says the signs are for Jews. So we see the gift of tongues given to the twelve disciples so that the Jews might believe. Now watch what Paul says about tongues. For 1 Corinthians 14.22 Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. You say you're a Pentecostal, you say you're a charismatic, and you say you speak in tongues. Are you even saved? Because tongues are not for those that believe. If you claim to be a believer, then you don't need tongues. Tongues are so that people that aren't saved will get saved. How? Like a missionary going in another tongue to a people of another nation and speaking in their tongue so that they might believe the gospel. You see, it's all about preaching the gospel. That's what it's supposed to be about. I told you, I was four years in that church movement, Pentecostals. Never heard the gospel one time. All I heard was blabber, 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 and I was not edified. They weren't even speaking in my tongue. When they preach a message, it was maybe 20 minutes long, and they never told me the truth. They twisted the scriptures to try to make me think that me speaking in tongues was something spiritual when I wasn't saying anything to anybody. And they tried to trick me into thinking that the Spirit of God was speaking to me and through me to God when the Bible says that when the Spirit speaks to God and intercedes, it's by groanings that can't even be uttered. So they're trying to get me to utter something. They can't. I get so angry when I think about that false denomination trying to deceive me. And I say, thank you, Jesus, that I'm not a part of the Pentecostal movement. Now, continuing here, look what it says here. Verse 22, Wherefore tongues are for sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying, what is that? Preaching, serveth not for them that believe not, but for them that believe. If you're a believer in Christ, guess what you need? You need to hear the scriptures preached. And that's the most important part of church, is learning the Bible and having a man guide you and teach you in the scriptures. Verse 23, If therefore the whole church be come together to one place, 
and all speak with tongues, other languages, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say, you're mad? <laughs> you're sitting in a church and everybody's got a different language, nobody understands each other. And somebody that's not even saved comes in and goes, this is crazy. They don't even know what they're talking or saying to each other. I'm leaving because this is, this is a madhouse. <laughs> yeah, it's a romper room. It's a craziness. You need to understand what's being preached. You go into a place like that and nobody understands each other. That's confusion. What does the Bible say? God's not the author of confusion. Now, look at verse uh, 24. But if all prophesy and there come in one that believeth not or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. Because he understands in his own language. 25, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Why? Because you heard of God being preached through you. Verse 26, how is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. It's all about edifying other people in the language that they speak so they can understand. Verse 27, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, that's a language that the church doesn't know. It's unknown to the church. Let it be by two or at the most by three and that by course and then let one interpret. So a man speaks in French, the church speaks English. He speaks French, nobody else speaks French except the guy that speaks French and Spanish. So he comes in and he interprets the French into Spanish and then this other guy speaks Spanish and English. Well then he translates from Spanish to English. You've got one, two, three guys on the stage you got two interpreters. Okay, so look, that's what he's talking about. Now look at verse 28. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Paul says, if you're in a church and no one is there to interpret your speaking in tongues, then shut up! <laughs> that's what be silent means. You should never speak in tongues in a church if you don't know what you're saying and you don't have someone else there to interpret what you're saying. When I was in the Pentecostal church, nobody knew what they were saying. They would all lift their hands in the air and say, God, we want your spirit. Speak to us now and help me to speak. And over here, and over here, and over here, and over here, and over here. And everybody in the church was going, and not one of them knew what they were saying. And every single one of them people were disobeying the word of God because the word of God says, shut up if you don't know what you're saying. That's what the verse says. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Shut up! If you don't know what you're saying, you should never say something unless you know what you're saying. I'm just reading the Bible. You want to get angry at me, do you? You're getting angry at God. That's what you're getting angry at. Let's finish it up here. Verse 29, let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. 30, if any thing be revealed to another that sits by, let the first hold his peace. 31, for you may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. 32, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Verse 33, for God is not the author of confusion but of peace as in all churches of the saints. Now, verse 34 and 35, listen to this. Because I've told you before, most of your Pentecostal charismatic churches are women. Many times women preachers, but women sitting in the pulpit. And when they get to the end of the service and they say, now let's all stand up and speak in tongues, it's the women that are the loudest saying, What does the Bible say about women speaking in tongues in the church? Verse 34, let your women keep silence in the churches. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. God says, if you're a woman, and you're in a church, and you want to speak in tongues, shut your mouth, or you're disobeying the scriptures. The Pentecostal charismatic movement disobeys God and the Bible. They have a false understanding of what tongues are. They're trying to utter something that God said cannot be uttered. They don't understand that tongues are always a written, spoken language. And what they claim is their gift of tongues is not the true gift. Otherwise, they would be speaking in another language that another person would understand. And it would only be men. Because the twelve apostles were only men. Men speaking in tongues. Never women in the scriptures. So it says here, let your women keep silence in the churches. The context of the chapter is speaking in tongues. Women, no speaking in tongues in the church. That's what God says. 
For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under the obedience, as also saith the law. Verse 35, And if, it, if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for a woman to speak, and the context is in tongues, in the church. You know what, I, what I've always wanted to do was go to a Pentecostal church and just walk in the back and say, Shame, shame, shame! <laughs> I know your name! I've never done that, but I've always wanted to. Because the Bible says it is a crying shame for a woman to stand up in a church and go blah, 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 because she is disobeying the Word of God. Hello? You still there? Have you clicked on something else yet? Well, if you're a Bible believer and you love God, you're still listening. But if you are Pentecostal and you don't have the Holy Spirit of God, boy, the demons inside of you right now are making you want to hit that button and move and go to something else. But I think what you ought to do is you ought to get on your knees and say, God, am I doing what the Bible says or am I in a cult? Am I in a false denomination, the Pentecostals, that are telling me to do something that's not right? I've showed you the verses. We'll close here, verse 36, 7, 38, 39, and 40. If they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. Verse 35. 36. What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. This is not Robert Breaker's denominational teaching or opinion. The commandments of God are written here. And God says, women, no. No speaking in the church. No speaking in tongues in the church. Verse 38, But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. If you want to be dumb on purpose and be ignorant and say, I refuse to obey the Bible, then help yourself. I'll see you at the judgment. And it says in verse 40, Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Hey, I'm not going to forbid you, if you're a man and you're a preacher, to speak in another language that others can understand. But look what it says, verse 40, Let all things be done decently, and in order. When I was in the Pentecostal church, it was not decent, it was not in order. In fact, it was sad. Because oftentimes what I saw, and it was so sad, was these women would, would begin to fall over. And they call it slain in the spirit. There's no slain in the spirit in the New Testament. But they would fall down, they begin to bark like dogs, and bruk, 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 cluck like chickens, and do crazy things, and bark bruk, 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 as they're falling all over the church. I mean, I've told this before, but there was a ministry in the church in which women had to carry handkerchiefs so that when a woman fell over, uh, you could look up her skirt. They'd have to come put the handkerchief on her skirt so no one would look up her skirt. That's not in the Bible. That's not scriptural. That's a problem. I don't see anywhere in the Word of God where it says we get slain in the Spirit, we fall over and bark like dogs and cluck like chickens. It sounds like to me that's the demonic spirit, not the Spirit of God. Because God said in Romans chapter 8 that the Holy Spirit, if He's in you, He intercedes to God the Father with groanings that cannot, cannot, cannot be uttered. So I look at this Pentecostal charismatic movement and it makes me want to cry. They don't go to Acts chapter 2 and see what tongues really are. Tongues are always a written spoken language that someone else is supposed to understand. And the reason you speak in tongues is to edify others that speak that language so that they may understand the things of God. It's not to just blah, 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 speak in the air, like Paul says. So, if you're mad, it's because you're mad at the Word of God. It's not Robert Brinker. Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> I'm just trying to tell you what God says about it. I pray you'll receive what Jesus says. God bless you. We'll see you next time as we continue the book of Acts.